Horror is a tricky genre. On one hand, it's a very complicated category of art that requires a very peculiar, sophisticated and masterful approach. But on the other hand, it almost never gets it. Horror fiction as a genre is almost totally devalued and has not yet found its place in our post-postmodernistic or metamodernistic culture. Not to mention that it's also relatively young, which also may be the reason, because it didn't have enough time to develop. And on top of that, horror has never been in a great demand until recently at least. Plus, the fact that the target audience for the genre is uh, very young people speaks for itself. So, it seems like these are tough times for true connoisseurs of horror in all of its manifestations. And video games are not the exception, of course. Usually, you can divide those into two types. First type is represented by thousands of so-called indie horrors, which are unspeakably terrible in all respects. And the second type is represented by high-budget indie or semi-AAA horror games, which use and abuse old, safe and simple things like suspense in its most basic form, that is also mostly used as a setup for jump scares, which relate to pretty basic forgettable and plain experiences and emotions like anxiety. Of course, there are exceptions, but there are quite few of them. Ironically, video games are probably the most comfortable place for the genre because of interaction, immersion and all variety of tools that can be used by authors and developers that aren't available in literature or film. And here we have it. A breath of fresh air, finally. A Japanese AAA title, which is also happens to be a part of a cherished franchise that returns to its roots from a story-driven action science fiction game to a survival horror, focusing on horror, as the director of the game stated, reinventing itself and some of its core concepts. Resident Evil 7. What could possibly go wrong? So, the first thing we notice is that Resident Evil now uses a first-person perspective. But why? Why exactly? Just to make it more scary, immersive and follow those trends of the modern first-person horrors and VR? There is much more into it. One of the big reasons for such a huge change is that the first-person perspective is very convenient for lots of psychological tricks, which are utilized by the game quite a lot. Soon after the game starts, we realize that, unlike last several games in the series, Resident Evil 7 takes place mostly in a house, a very claustrophobic house. Claustrophobia is the fear of being enclosed in a small space and having no escape, and the first-person perspective fits it perfectly, especially in VR, because it makes much more intimate connection between the player and his surroundings, and allows the game to put the player in very tight spaces, since it doesn't require any extra space for a camera, like in a third-person perspective. Most of the time you'll find yourself in small claustrophobic rooms and narrow hallways. The doors will close behind your back. Some sequences of the game are literally hell for people affected by severe claustrophobia. But it doesn't end here. Claustrophobia has a very good friend, a fear of being a prey to a predator. Which even by itself is a very strong fear, because it's our primal fear that sits very deep in our brain. And the fear intensifies because you soon realize that there is something terribly wrong with the house and its inhabitants. And they are looking for you, and there is no much place to run. And the game utilizes this concept a lot, showing you how weak and powerless you are against your enemy, which ends up to the understanding that you are not an enemy in this place, but just a prey in a claustrophobic environment with no much place to run. Another important thing about first-person perspective here is that not only you see from it, but also hear. In the first-person perspective there is much more room for sound designers to play with sound, because here the player has much better intuitive understanding and feeling of sound, like the direction it comes from or the reverberation which gives our brain the information about our surroundings, about the size of the room we're in, about materials and surfaces the sound waves are reflected off. And that's probably the first thing I noticed about this game, how good it sounds. Most sounds in this game also follow the concept of claustrophobic effect. They have very little resonation, they're quite dull, almost no reverberation emphasizing the smallness of space. It builds a very intimate feeling of the game, so much that you'll be probably freaked out by the sounds produced by a protagonist's body 
thinking something is approaching. The sound of the game is also noticeably influenced by Yamaoka's works, utilizing silence and lots of sounds from unknown sources and the contrast between those two. And that's a quite a good trick, actually, because you are in a very unsafe environment in which everything that makes any sound has a potential threat to you. And there is something in those walls that makes very creepy noises, which you can't identify. You don't know what it is, but you have reasons to assume that it's something you don't want to face. And on the other hand, if there are no sounds, like a dead silence, it provokes a feeling that the object of threat is in full control of the situation, meaning that it's silent not because it's gone, but because it knows exactly where you are and it's getting ready for the move which for the player may lead to a jump scare, but you never know for sure. As an old friend of mine once said, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Basically, the fear of the unknown is the deepest fear, especially if you are a human being because of the ability to the abstract thought. And it all depends on how good the source of fear is shaped and presented. And from here we can dig a bit deeper and make some interpretations. Fear is a feeling induced by perceived danger or threat. It's our survival mechanism that saved more lives than medicine. But what if the threat is unknown? What if this threat is so utterly powerful that we cannot even estimate it? What if it's just beyond our imagination? What if death is not the biggest problem? If we look at the best horror games in terms of horror design, we'll notice that they're all focused on the fear of the unknown. Take Silent Hill 2, for example. It's the essence of it, where the fear of the unknown is mixed with messing with Freud's Eros and Thanatos concepts and very well done overall visual and sound design. Here you may ask a question. If fear of the unknown is so powerful, then why are we so afraid of cheap jump scares, which are also present in this game? Jump scares. They play quite a different role. They're not something that won't let you sleep or something that you will still be remembering years after. Their task is to scare shit out of you for one second and to make you afraid of them happening again. Plus, not all jump scares are a cheap trick. There are good jump scares with very good setups. Furthermore, they're also born from the fear of the unknown, if you think about it. So, how do jump scares work? First, it's a learned fear, because it happened to us at least once in a lifetime. It's like touching something very hot. Once you did it and learned that it's gonna hurt, you won't probably do it again. And there are games that utilize this part even though they don't have any actual jump scares. Second, we know that something scary is gonna happen, but we don't know what exactly, when exactly and how exactly it will happen, because it is unknown. Third, the reason why you are so scared at the moment of a jump scare is that what jump scares do is they're just mocking our amygdala, basically. They give us a very huge amount of stimulus in a very short period of time, so our brain understands that something very big is happening, but it doesn't have enough time to analyze what it is exactly. So it is unknown. The fear of the unknown. Because not only this unknown may be a grave danger, but also we can't even estimate how dangerous it is. And yes, the game has few jump scares and they are not bad, but nothing special. What's interesting about jump scares here is that occasionally you'll probably face some kind of unscripted jump scares that happen because you haven't noticed something or made a wrong move, didn't pay attention or just was overstrained by suspense, for example. And it's a very good thing, actually, because it doesn't feel artificial or staged, it feels more natural, like it's not the developers who are responsible for that, thereby making it more alive and scary. Let's have a look on a different implementation of this technique, which was done more purposefully. So, another advantage the game takes from the first-person perspective is limited sight. Thus, in addition to more unsafe feeling during your stay in Baker's residence, it's also very good for playing with your focus and attention. And the game does this more than once. So, here we are walking into the house with two other people, shooting video. 
And at some point, this guy brings our attention to himself, while the other guy disappears. And if it was a movie or some different game, it would be just a fixed camera pointing in the direction of the guy, where we can't look away physically. But here we can, we just don't. And that is the point, because we are responsible for not noticing him disappear, and that is what makes it more scary. I personally found this quite interesting. Monsters. Monsters, especially in horror genre, is a big thing in terms of design, because concept designers need to have quite a different approach to their work, compared to what they usually do. Considering lots of different things and working with very subtle matters, diving deeper into psychology. And the only somehow memorable monster design in this game belongs to Marguerite, for me at least. Even though it's a bit cliché, it's probably the first appearance of this kind of a monster design with such a good animations and overall visual presentation in the history of video games. So let's talk about her for a second. Her design consists mainly of two parts, and they're both quite traditional. The first one is the contrast between human features and some very unnatural features, like when some horrible, very scary, unnatural monster suddenly appears to have some very natural human features, like a human face or human hands, I'm sure you've seen it before. And vice versa, like the design of Marguerite, when a normal human body has some very unnatural features, like very long limbs. Which also bring us to the second part of her design, relations to phobias. Arachnophobia in our case. A phobia that affects millions and millions of people, which is presented not only by the way she looks, but also by the way she moves. And those two parts are present and abundantly used in lots and lots of monster designs in horror fiction. And this is where the good part ends. All I've been talking about here until this point, you can just forget it. Because now we're gonna be talking about the second half of the game, in which, unexpectedly, Resident Evil 7 decides to commit suicide as a horror game. Lots of players have noticed that the second half of the game isn't quite scary. But why? Maybe because the game turned into a first-person shooter, or maybe because of the change of the environment? Well, kind of yes, but there's much more into it. So, what do you need to kill horror in any type of content? I'll teach you. First, cliché. By using cliché in horror, you are affecting the perception of a player, or a reader, or viewer. Because he'll be perceiving the source of horror not as an authentic part of the local world and story, but as an object, a technique that he has seen before many times, looking down on it, because he won't be able to believe in it, to take it seriously. And that's why zombies became a caricature of themselves at some point, even though they were scary some time ago. But now they mostly appear in comedies, action movies, thrillers, melodramas, dramas, anything but horror. And here we have it. A powerful, evil little girl. Yeah. Possessed kids speaking in Satan's voice, ghost kids, demonic kids, kids somehow connected to the afterworld. Girls, usually. That's probably the most overused thing in all types of horror since early 90s. Originally, it is a psychological trick, where something childish, safe and innocent is mixed with something threatening and horrific, therefore producing a cognitive dissonance in your brain, therefore making it scary. And demonic girls are not its only manifestation, of course. And this trick can also be used with sound, like it was in that famous Dead Space trailer, where we hear a lullaby, which is associated with something calm, very secure, protective. It was even sung to some of us while we were falling asleep, and it's mixed with these visuals. And it kind of works, but now it seems like people just forgot about the original principles and functions of this technique and just endlessly reusing its worst manifestations. Second, explanations. The worst thing you can do to the source of horror is to start explaining it. And in case of this game, it seems like it was its conscious choice to stop being a horror in favor of being a third-rate science fiction. Because in the second half of the game, it starts to explain everything. The value in the source of horror, Evelyn, as hard as possible. We find out pretty much everything about her, even a detailed description of her properties, because the game decided to develop its plot in the direction of the source of horror. 
I mean, why couldn't it just develop the plot in any other direction? Focus on Bakers, for example, that crazy family, without telling us what exactly happened to them. In that case, we would have been contacting things that contacted the source of horror without us contacting it directly. And this is a pretty good method to do things in horror genre. Of course, if the game wanted to explain stuff so badly, it could have given us hints at least, instead of explaining everything, leaving some room for speculations, for the unknown. The reason why Silent Hill 2 remains to be so spooky, mysteriously scary and strange even after we finish the game is that it didn't develop its story in the direction of the source of horror. I mean, of course Silent Hill 2 isn't a game about fighting the city and its inhabitants, neither it's about finding the truth behind the horrible secrets of the city. It was about people, their nature and relationships. And the city was just a catalyst to develop those. But wait, I think I know a video game which was quite scary even though it was very similar to Resident Evil 7. It's also in first-person perspective, it also develops its story in the direction of the source of horror, which is also a girl with lots of power, and it's also science fiction. I'm talking about fear. That game was focused on shooting and was very good at it. It did have some scare factor, of course, but unlike Resident Evil 7, it didn't present itself as a very scary survival horror that is focused on horror. And despite all of that, it beats the second half of the Resident Evil 7, no doubt. I mean, how come? What's so different about it? Well, here we have the third problem. Personification slash humanization. In Fear, the main source of horror was Alma. And she never spoke. She never showed us any vivid emotions. We had no idea what she had truly become. What she is thinking about. If she is thinking as we imagine the process of thinking. We don't know what she is, but we do understand that she is something much bigger than we are. That's very important. But in this game, Evelyn is just a little girl with totally understandable and natural motives for a little giggling girl with lots of power. Her emotions are totally normal, her behavior model is also normal and very familiar to us humans. Her methods may be cruel, but that's also understandable. We know everything about her, her nature, her properties, past, motives, personality, etc. She's just a bad girl with superpower. And she's just our enemy. The game even calls her the little bitch numerous times. Making the player not to be afraid of her, but to hate her for... I don't know, killing people we didn't care about or taking our life despite the game didn't care to present her as someone to whom the player would feel something. I just... I have no idea. And now you know what to do in case you want to destroy horror in your work of fiction, for some reason. Once those three are implemented, your film, book or game will stop being horror and, in the very best case, it will become a thriller. The more you know. Oh, we also have a plot twist here. And plot twists can work great with horror, they can be quite creepy and emotionally impactful, like in Silent Hill or Silent Hill 2. But in Resident Evil 7, the plot twist was written inside one of the documents we find at some point of the game. Before the plot twist happens. Like as if the game hoped that I won't waste my time reading it, I, I don't know. Not to mention that it was quite obvious from the beginning. Maybe it just wasn't plot twist at all, I, I don't know. So, to sum it up, the first half of the game wasn't perfect, but it had some relatively fresh and good ideas, with very good execution, some good overall design, it had some cool horror action roller coasters, it was solid and quite good. But in the second half, it just suddenly decided to become a kitschy sci fi shooter with a survival horror skeleton and gameplay which was quite disappointing. 